Well, hello. Welcome back to the Tomb of Terror, episode 711. It's April 15th, 2023. Five days till my birthday. I'll be turning 58. And the world's on the brink of nuclear war, and um, um, we're having a wonderful time organizing uh, digest magazines, comics, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So, How are you guys doing on this lovely, rainy, at least it's rainy here, uh, April afternoon, Saturday afternoon? Um, got a lot of these smaller sized uh, digest magazines, and I need to... Uh, Get them in here organized properly. I showed these to you last time. These uh, came from Tommy O'Brien on uh, e Facebook. So let's get these in here. Where's the other one, man? I was showing them on Four Color Fossils on Wednesday. I was in a bad mood. I don't know why anyone would be in a bad mood um, in 2023. Everything's, the economy's going great. All the movies coming out are wonderful. All, all, everything's great. Joe Biden is just a fantastic president. Why would anyone have any reason to be depressed? Um, now these were, I should do these. Anyway, my wife was saying you shouldn't go on someone else's show and rant and rave, you know, save that for your own show, you know, that's, that was really kind of rude, I didn't mean to come across as rude, I don't know, oh, let's see, what is this, um, so it's a, so how are you guys doing, it's a wonderful day, isn't it, just fantastic, this is, uh, Someone was saying, uh, I was reading on Facebook, someone was saying this, they, they're charging a lot for this on uh, eBay. It's a limited edition. Mine is number 0334. This was put out by Lindsay Hutton, who ran the Legion of the Cramped, the Cramps fan club in the late 70s, and it's a collection of articles. Um, from different magazines it's pretty much a scrapbook of the history of the band up till that point and uh, he put it out copied it and it, it's uh, put together with a rubber band and that's uh, I went to this uh, you know in Dallas there were these punk rock record stores and, and that was I found that at one of them and it was older it was just in a big pot there were some really good punk rock record stores like Direct Hit Records run by uh, Kelly uh, Keys, I believe. Yeah, shoot, um, that was in the 90s. There was Metamorphosis that went back to the early days. Um, but then there was one that was gigantic called Bill's Records. And Bill has passed away. But... Um, he had nothing priced in his store, and uh, you had to bring up whatever you found, and you know your hands would get filthy searching through all this stuff. But there was a lot of records there, a lot of records, and, and then he'd price it, and he'd price it. You know, he'd he'd swag a price based on. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but it was a whole creepy experience. Anyway, that's where I bought that uh, Cramps book, is at Bill's Records. Somebody even made a documentary about him. Um, I wish I could think of some good things to say about Bill's Records. Apparently someone did, because they made a whole documentary about it. But I found that place to be a horrific experience. And uh, the stories I've heard... <laughs> I just won't even get into it. Um, oh yes, this was sent to me by Lead Paint. This is a wonderful EC fanzine. Let's get this in, in here. So, uh, 
is a homemade uh, magazine I made years ago when I was teaching sixth graders and this is filled with their articles and things like that. All these cartoons done by students. Hmm. Five. There's another one of those. Issue six. That's another issue five, but with a different color cover. Here's issue four. Okay. These are uh, copies of uh, a fanzine, the Betty Pages. I wouldn't really call it a fanzine. It was professionally printed by Greg Theakston and... Uh, he did the covers there too on that one. Okay, so that goes there. Will this fit in there? Yeah, now this is a guide to making good home movies. Anyway, let's get this. In. I, I use this uh, small comic box to put these uh, smaller books in. Here's a bunch of stuff. I guess this was, I guess these were my father's. These were uh, little pamphlets about different battles in the Civil War. Looks, what are these dated? I've always seen them in the house, you know. Uh, it's dated 1960, I was born in 65. These have just been omnipresent, always in the house. My dad was a real, uh, history buff. This is about Scott's Bluff. Um, 1958. They're, par they're from the National Park Service Historical Handbook Series. <clears throat> so, yeah, they, these are all from the same source. Different Civil War battles. Um, Vicksburg. Gettysburg. Let's get these in here too. Um, I think, was it two or three days ago was the anniversary of the firing on Fort Sumter, the beginning of the Civil War? Um, yeah, that happened in April of 1861. Uh, here, here's uh, Custer's uh, battlefield. Hmm. There's a picture. In fact, I think that's it. I've seen this in color, though. It's actually drawn. I've, I've seen a bigger version, maybe in one of those Time Life history books. But uh, it's drawn by Indians after the battle. And you see the Indians on horseback. And um, you can see all the U.S. soldiers are all just dismembered and their arms and legs are cut off. And, um, yeah, they're... Um, all right, so that's that. Oh, there's more. Scheiße. Um... Just anything. Uh, no. Seeing if these are these are little toy catalogs from before the internet, um, where you could uh, connect with people that had these toys for sale. Yeah, summer of 92. Um, <clears throat> there's some pictures, mostly it's text. I guess um, it would be interesting to um, see what things, what prices toys were going for in 
92, which is winter of 92, I'd say 30 years ago. That's kind of kind of scary. Some more, yeah, I guess I was on their mailing list for a while. I must have ordered something from them. I was uh, right around that time, 92, I was really getting a lot of Adams Family uh, toys from the 60s. Um, I probably ordered like an Uncle Fester light bulb from them or something, and so I stayed on their mailing list for a good while. Um, there's uh, Mechanics Illustrated. <coughs> Um, what else do we have over here? I showed these to you last time, I, I believe. Um, yeah, I, I haven't done a show since last Saturday. It's been a week. Um, I just um, kind of surviving. Anything else we can put in here? get some mending tissue or something for this cover it's torn almost completely in half I um, but when I see a copy of the three Mouseketeers even if the cover is torn all the way to here if it's for sale you know uh, very inexpensively I mean I'm going to get it just to read it because um, the three Mouseketeers <sighs> Uh, this was one of the first, uh, these are some of the first comic characters I was introduced to as a kid. Um, this, um, I guess around 1970, maybe 71, they uh, reprinted some of the Three Mouseketeers uh, stories um, in uh, and I didn't know, I, I didn't know they were actually stories from the 50s. I, uh, I thought they were new stories and I really enjoyed them and uh, and so I have a deep connection to I really love and I love this artist um, I wonder if they even credit him this is a uh, I actually found my magnifying glass this light is like bleaching me out let me move it farther away. It's one of these stupid ring lights, man. Um, that's better. Hopefully that's better. Um, just a second.
went in the other room with a purpose. I knew I was going in there for a reason, and then I went in the other room and could not remember why I had gone into that room. I was like, why am I here? And, and then I realized, oh, I was looking for this magnifying glass, which I bought back in the old country at a hardware store. And uh, um, this is a atomic powered uh, magnifying glass that, uh, uh, well, the light's pretty much burned out. It used to have a light. And I used to use this on my show back in the early days. And, and then, you know, uh, the Crypt Keeper of Castle Hills in San Antonio, Mike, was like, where do you get those? Well, I just got it at the hardware store, and he went out and found one. And I noticed that uh, Gotham City Comics, when I was talking to him on the phone the other night, was using one, and Captain Strange Life's got one. So everybody is hip to the fact that you have these l lighted magnifying glasses. Um, oh, it just takes a double-A battery. And I can light this sucker up let's go get a double a battery i know where some are ah. God. it's um wonderful <laughs> to have every time i stand up it's it's like uh, um horrifying um horrifyingly uh, fat um my knees are about to just give out completely well, it's a rainy day here, and um, perfect time to organize comics. Okay, I bought batteries. Where are the batteries? Where are the batteries I bought? Gee, Josephat. As you are aware, where did I put them? Are they out here? Where? Oh boy. These are some magical Pleiadians from the other side of the universe talking to me through my television. Octurians and others who have aided us in our journey. The Where did I put the was established? Batteries. The Federation has been collaborating with humankind for a very long time. Oh, are they over here in the library, perhaps? No, they are not here. I need that magnifying glass, man. I tell him I can't see a dang thing. Oh, here's some. What, are they good? I don't know. We'll find out. Well, we should, there'll be a, a birthday show on Thursday, possibly Friday. Oh, now it's starting to shine a little bit more, just because I played with a battery, I guess. They say you're not supposed to um, shine this into your eyes. I guess that's kind of an obvious thing. Oh, it takes several. It takes two batteries, actually. Let's hope these batteries are good that I'm putting in. I don't. They may not be. Man, those other ones might have been better. 
Why do I put batteries that are no good back into a drawer? What, what is wrong with me? All right. Those are the original batteries I had in there. But now that I've um, played around with them, they seem to actually be working. So Let's head back. I've had enough of this new age uh, insane alien on YouTube. Okay. We're already 20 minutes in. I haven't even shown you anything. Oh, anyway, I was going to tell you, tell you about these three Musketeer comics. Yeah. Shelly Meyer, that does the artwork for Three Musketeers, also does the uh, also uh, created Sugar and Spike. Um, about these two kids, toddlers, that uh, they can understand each other, but uh, no one else can because they're like infants. But they're and that's a great comic too. But Shelly Meyer is the person I've told you this 15 times. Shelly Meyer's the guy that uh, pulled. Siegel and Schuster's original proposal for Superman that they submitted to DC, which was called National at the time. They, he pulled it out of the trash can and said, hey, this is really good. You need to rethink that. So if it wasn't for Shelley Meyer, this artist here, you um, wouldn't have Superman. Hey kids, ride a Schwinn Jaguar. Pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, this is all messed up. It's got a spine roll. You know, it's barely holding together. But it's a perfectly good uh, reading copy. And it's got an ad for automatic firing tripod machine gun. Now, some of you uh, love to get uh, comic books in omnibus editions where they're gigantically thick like a family Bible and weigh about 20 pounds on your lap. But the problem with those is they don't have these these ads. Look, here's the, no, they never did an omnibus of the Three Musketeers as far as I know. But look at this Dairy Queen ad. Look at this ad here for Palisades Amusement Park. Um, the only other people I, I see, uh, you know, that seem to be like me, that appreciate advertisements, seem to be the other guys in the Four Color Fossils we meet every Wednesday night on Graphic Man's channel. Captain Strange Life is just like me as far as loving the ads. I mean, the ads are as much fun as the actual content. And uh, because it's so evocative of the time, they're wonderful. Advertising is, is a big part of our life. We don't realize that the commercials of today are horrible. Um, but, you know, you were, I remember being so meticulous, though, back in the, when I first got my first VCR. Whenever it'd be a commercial, I'd, I'd press pause and I'd eliminate the commercials so I'd have a recording of the show without commercials. But now, all those shows are available on DVD, Blu-ray. What's cool now are the commercials, and there's all these people that put up commercials on YouTube. By the way, I have now completed five episodes of a DVD version of The Tomb of Terror. And it is not me talking. It's just a hodgepodge of cartoons, music videos, movie trailers, TV commercials, all kinds of stuff. If you have ever liked the Hypnotic Eye TV show from the 1990s, which uh, Joe Riley uh, produced and, and I helped with on some of the early episodes, this is just like that. It'll feel just like new episodes of that. So I've, I've just this morning finished the fifth installment. Each one is two hours long, so that's ten hours. Two times five equals ten. Of uh, it's pretty great entertainment. I mean, it it, enter it entertains me 
I'll put it that way. So this is this is what I enjoy watching. Um, I was going to sell these and mail them out through the mail. Only thing is, I don't know a fair price. You know, people said you know fifteen twenty dollars. Someone said I'll pay twenty dollars. Well, there's five of them. You know, that'd be a hundred dollars for all five. Seems like I should cut a break on that. I I mean they're not they're they're DVD dash R's. They're not produced in a factory and I, I would create some kind of artwork for each shell you know but then the something weird VHS cassettes that were quasi legal before DVDs came out I think he sold those for 15 20 dollars and that was in the 90s or late 80s so I maybe I'm undervaluing my work and my time that I, I just don't want to have people think I'm some ripoff artist either, and then some of the music videos on there. I don't know. Um, it, it's mainly I feel like you're mainly just you know I'm, I'm giving up time on my television to record you know make the copies because I have to record them the way I do it in real time. Anyway, if you're interested, again, just put comments down below and subscribe and ring the bell and do all that ridiculous bull. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get on Rumble. I figure, uh, I don't know, I've been told I'm probably shadow banned that uh, because I talk about politics so much that uh, YouTube probably doesn't want me to get uh, too many... Uh, uh, viewers uh, but I don't know I'm up I'm up past 500 now but it took me three years to do that. I want to get up to a thousand so I can start having some real fun all right let's look at some uh, comics that I got in this box probably stuff you've seen before well you'll see it again how about that like thrilling cases of police action <laughs> that's a lot of text that's a lot of text there okay so it's uh, number 8 from June of 1955 I know that because it's written on the back this was actually a gift from Night Tiger Comics so this would have been right after the Comics Code Authority stamp started being put on books because see it's very large and notice there's no blood and there's not someone actually being shot so um, and also if it was before this symbol the word crime would be huge and possibly dripping blood and police against would be tiny police against Crime. That's how they would do it before the uh, before that. All right. Here is a riot of fun and adventure. What strange! Remember that those riots of fun and adventure a couple of summers ago. Mostly peaceful though. There's some weird piece of tape at the bottom of this. Oh, I see. Someone had, uh, had taped this in a very strange way. Anyway, this is from May of 1947. It's got L.B. Cole interior art. Let's, let's, uh, oh, it doesn't have tape. Let's just open it up and take a look at this. This ad. Girls, here are two of the newest, smartest bow catchers you've ever seen. Bo is means boyfriend. For those of you that aren't 80 years old, um, this is interesting. Um, it's interesting how the ads are here, and then they just have this blank space in the center between the two uh, rows of ads. Um, I like this. Uh, how to make yourself commando tough. Yeah, these old books are very fragile. You have to be careful handling them. But the alternative is sealing them in plastic, which you think will 
keep them fine forever, but uh, I don't. I don't think. You know, you're. I I, I kind of question that. You know, if um. Oh well, I I talk uh, I, uh, so much against slabbing comics. I think it's folly. I think it's foolishness. Books are meant to be read, you know, in my opinion. And then I, I think I just annoy people that like to slab their books because it, what is the term they used to teach you in college? Cognitive dissonance. It's like I'm doing something that's cool. Everybody slabs their books. Wait, there's this guy on YouTube that says it's not a good thing. It's bothering me. You know, so I don't want to create cognitive dissonance for you folks out there. It's Mary Mouse. I I just, you know, I I don't. I'm not a big proponent of slabbing books. <coughs> so whatever, whatever, dude. Oh uh, yes, there's some truly insane looking art. Look at that. This is um pretty nuts. Um Yeah, I'm looking at something from 1947, which is I think the year my dad graduated high school. Um well yeah, well, maybe he, or maybe he graduated in 46. Regardless, my dad was a young man. My father's no longer here. And, um, maybe he's here around me, but he's no longer here on this earth. Um, so it's kind of a, it's kind of wild to, I don't have much, many golden age comics. They're, they're a responsibility. They're, um, when you have a lot of Golden Age comics, you truly are a museum curator. You are definitely preserving history for future generations. Um, if you just, m much more so than it's like, oh, I've got New Mutants 98 with the first Deadpool. <laughs> Who cares? There's a million of those out there. But there aren't a million of copies of Toy Town number seven from May 1947 and uh, um, I don't know what <laughs> if there's any rhyme or reason to this box at all here's a coverless Dale Evans now wow. this artwork is great but then like I said I'm just as taken by this Captain Tootsie ad Captain Tootsie. They should bring back Captain Tootsie. Speaking of Captain Tootsie, my mind went to, uh, my mind goes everywhere. I was thinking of Captain Marvel. You know, there's a real Captain Marvel from Fawcett, you know, the real, the one that they now call Shazam. But anyway, the Marvel, <sighs> Captain Marvel, that used to be called Ms. Marvel, but is now called Captain Marvel. And then there's a young teenage Ms. Marvel that is some new character that only, uh, I, I don't know who buys that stuff, Kamala Khan or whatever, Her Kamala Harris or whatever the little girl is called. That's, and then there's Monica Rambeau, which is also, she goes back, and I think she was Captain Marvel for a while and wore a white outfit and had an afro and was, I think she was in charge of the Avengers for a while. I was not reading that comic then. I don't, I'm aware of it, but I didn't read them then. They were probably great. And you'll probably tell me those were great stories in that era. It just, I'm guessing that when Monica Rambeau was in charge of the Avengers, that was the late 1980s. And I actually had friends then and we were, 
um, in college and then I was still buying collectibles, but I was buying far more records than than CDs started coming out and I was buying movie posters and I'd buy comic books, but mostly older comic books. I wasn't getting much off the newsstand and, and I must have turned my nose up at the... Anyway, why do I mention all of these uh, dumb characters? Because they're, they just released a trailer a couple of days called The Marvels with all three of those Marvel women characters teamed up. It looks unbelievably, breathtakingly bad. And I'm sure you've heard everyone on YouTube say that. But it's like, what are you... What? And... Um, now, the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, I'm completely open to that. I like James Gunn's work. I know, I, I can tell he's someone that respects comics. You, you, I still have trouble with his Twitter stuff. That's Twitter stuff that got him fired for, from Disney. But then, of course, they later, re, they later rehired him. But that stuff was not funny. And scary and um, either he was just trying to be offensive but why if you're trying to be offensive why not scatter out your offensiveness instead of just on one horrible topic and or he was just making fun of Hollywood because that proliferates among apparently not just Hollywood but politicians and, and the elite and uh, which is why I think we have legends of vampires going back centuries, you know, because of the elite, the people in their castles up on the hill preying on people. And, uh, you know, maybe he was making fun of that because he saw it around him in Hollywood. But boy, I don't know. Um Anyway, I forgive James Gunn. It looks like the Guardians of the Galaxy movie comes out. Let's see. Today being the 15th, I think it comes out the 5th. I don't know if it, when I'll see it. If We have uh, one local movie theater, and they play one movie. Um, uh, they get a movie, and it stays for two weeks, and it gets shown six times, and then they get another movie. I hope they book Guardians of the Galaxy at the local theater, which is about two blocks from me, I'll just walk up or, I mean, I'll drive up to see it with my wife, but if, if I was single, I'd just walk there, you know, but I'm not going to make my wife walk to the, anyway, it's close, but they got Ant-Man and I was excited about that. Then I heard all the bad word about Ant-Man, the last Ant-Man movie. I didn't even bother to go see it. It's like, Disney has completely, officially messed it all up. Okay. I've shown you all these before. Here's Yak Yak. That's Jack Davis art. Speaking of, okay, all right. Yeah, I meant to actually dedicate this episode to Al Jaffe, who was 101, or was he 102 years old? He passed away the other day. Al Jaffe, the great mad cartoonist, one of the last surviving ones. I thought maybe Sergio Aragonis was the only other surviving guy from that original kind of 50, late 50s, early six, or six, 1960s and 70s crew. But Angela Torres, I forgot, he's, he's still around. That's great. But um, yeah, that Al Jaffe did, of course, the fold-in, which... Um, was a parody of Playboy's fold, out, fold, you know, centerfold that folds out. Instead, on the last page of Mad, you'd fold it in, and then it would create a new picture. And then, but you know, uh, what I would do went with a copy of Mad is I would I wouldn't actually crease the magazine. I would kind of I'll show you with this copy of Wizard. Oh, X three. That was pathetic. Um. Well, what I would do is I I kind of uh, I kind of just you know bend it a little bit and squint to see what the picture formed because I didn't want to actually crease a, a magazine. But anyway, um, 
Um, here's uh, Tippy Terry, the red-headed tornado. Obviously, Tippy Terry is an uh, imitation of Dennis the Menace. Um, anyway, I have a tremendous respect for all the minds behind Mad Magazine. High power binoculars see up to 18 miles. 18 miles! Um, well, this is fun reading. And this one is from... See, that's the great thing about my atomic uh, magnifier. Is uh, It's no longer... I'm going to keep this with me. I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of being embarrassed trying to... Um, do the show. Oh, it's from 19... Oh, reprinted in USA 1963. So this is actually a uh, a reprint from something earlier. Um, I really like these these uh, emblems, these little uh, mascots for the baseball teams. They just were so much cooler back then. Look at that. I'm not a big sports person. I've got, hey, my that's my grandfather there was a professional baseball player. I, I, every so often I look him up on eBay to see if there's any memorabilia of my grandfather for sale. Um, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. They're calling them sea monkeys, but they're not. This is a sea, an early sea monkey ad. They're promoting it as a circus, and but they don't have sea monkeys real big, um, and they don't show the sea monkeys looking like a nuclear uh, mid-century family. You know, there's dad, you know, almost smoking a cigar, and the mom and the kids. Um, it says, "Just add water, and you've got instant life." Yes, it's the living truth. In just 24 to 72 hours, you can actually hatch a whole tumbling, playful, happy troop of sea monkeys. Exotic Saskatchewan brine shrimp that are more fun than a barrel full of monkeys. Both children and adults will laugh and thrill with wonderful excitement as you watch the comic antics of these fantastic underwater buffoons. Any minute of the day or night, you'll see them chase one another in a playful game of tag. The loser gets caught by the tail and spun in a dizzy circle. See the show-offs turn cartwheels in the water. See the ticklish ones scratch each other's backs. Watch them swim singly or in graceful formation, creating an underwater circus. Well, I, the, the, what, how did they describe it? Um, you'll... Children and adults will laugh and thrill with wonderful excitement. Um, brain damaged ones, possibly. Um, kissing dolls. Look at these ads are just so great. Look at these gun cigarette lighters. It's just stuff that could never be sold to people today. Um, yeah, this. Uh, Super comics. I think this is a whole line of comics that were reprinted in the early 60s from, I think, as I, yeah, I remember now that this, this was a whole line of reprint comics that uh, someone uh, wound up with a bunch of the uh, original art and they just started reprinting this stuff. And uh, so, yeah, Tippy Terry. So, That's not something that's super valuable, but to me it's valuable because it's cool. Oh, okay, well here, you know, <laughs> Harvey Kurtzman created Mad and then walked away from it because he was pissed. And um, then he tr spent years trying to recreate and rebottle that. Here's one of his attempts, Humbug, another which is uh, smaller than an actual size comic. Um, um, Here's three musketeers. See, it's uh, it's smaller, um, but um, I guess he did this to distinguish it from a comic book.
but um, he also put out Trump, which was um, done very slickly, and that was done with Hugh Hefner's money. Hugh Hefner funded uh, Trump, and it didn't work out, and then Hefner pulled the money, and so then later he he did help for Warren Publications, and and then Hugh Hefner hired him to do Little Annie Fanny, and he just did that for decades with Will Elder. Because, you know, security, you know, you got your insurance, you got retirement, you know, you're working for Hugh Hefner, you can hang out with him at his parties, so he, that was uh, his career from then on. Um, so that kind of stunted a lot, oh, probably a lot of great stuff that he could have done if he wasn't just doing the secure route, but, um, you know, sometimes you follow your your gut, you follow your, you know, what this is, what I think is right. You know, like Steve Ditko left Marvel with a dispute with Steve, with Stan Lee, even though he's really the pretty much the sole creator of Doctor Strange and 95% creator of Spider-Man and all the original villains. Um, but, you know, it's like I, they couldn't, it just didn't work with his conscience, so he left, and he could never, you know, rebottle that. He could never create another Spider-Man or Doctor Strange. He was created some cool characters, but they just he never got, you know. I I think to a certain extent, I don't know. It seems like you almost or some people are born with a certain amount of um, creativity, and then. Um, once you use it up, you just like it's gone. It's like what happened to Paul McCartney? All the great songs he wrote in the '60s with the Beatles, and then he couldn't do anything past like 1975 that I can remember. Um, even in 1975, it's starting to get pretty weak. But I remember the you know the James Bond theme was was great and some of the early stuff of the Wings. But then since then, it's just like yeah yeah la 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 la. And you know, was it only because he had John Lennon there as a as a counterpoint to make his songs a little tougher? I I don't know, but or or was it smoking marijuana just stunting his creativity? Um, could be that too. But anyway, let's look at Humbug. Welcome to the Queen. I like this on the back. So this is um. This is uh, made to look like uh, Time Magazine. Uh, 15 cents a steal. It's kind of like mad. It always said cheap. Now this, uh, the ads look like real ads until you look at them very carefully and see it doesn't say Chanel, it says Channel. And there's a dead bug in the <laughs> floating in it. But um, he did things to make it you know, it's got parodies like Mad would have, but he chose to do this, um, the thing that makes this a little odd or different. He might have been doing this to make it look a little less like a comic book and have the the print that is not uh, handwritten. And I, I prefer handwritten uh, lettering. But it's uh, very much like Mad. It's... Uh, it just, you know, kids were, and adults were buying mad, and Humbug didn't take off for whatever reason, maybe um, distribution, I don't know. There's a, you can get uh, all the Humbugs reprinted. I've got a reprint set of all of them. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Um... Here's Tip Top, number 174. These reprinted newspaper comic strips. Um, what I get mixed up, there's Tip Topper, and then there's Tip Top, and I'm trying to remember, is this the same comic? This one I've had since the late 70s. You see, um, and this would have been one of the first... Uh, 
uh, Golden Age or Atomic Age comics that um, I had um, because in the summer of 77, a comic book store opened in my town. Um, close enough, you know, I would be driven there. I was in, that was the summer between 6th and 7th grade. But I would actually walk all the way there. And it was a, it was many miles, uh, but I would walk. And um, it was Lone Star Comics. It's now mycomicshop.com, their first store. And uh, the only Golden Age comics they had out were um, were these, and I think an issue of Madhouse, uh, not the Archie Madhouse, but the 50s one that was a mad imitation. And I, I would snap these up, and they weren't very expensive, but it was just cool to be getting something that was from... Uh, this is number 22, April, May of 1953. So this is before the, the Comics Code. <laughs> Look at this ad, man. This would give uh, <laughs> all these people, uh, these anti-gun people would have, uh, they'd be clutching their pearls today. If, But you see, it's just reprints of Sunday comic strips, Fritzy Ritz. Um, some people don't know that Nancy and Sluggo uh, were were in. Fritzy Ritz is the aunt of Nancy, of Nancy, and uh, but Nancy became popular, and then Fritzy Ritz was moved to the background, and then it became Nancy. It's kind of like Happy Days was supposed to be about Richie Cunningham. But then Fonzie became super popular, and they almost changed it to the Happy Day, the ha the Fonz Show, or Happy Fo Fonzie's Happy Days. I think they were going to change it to that. And, and you know, sometimes it's like, hey, that's the character everyone's buying the posters of, and it's the one that's selling. So, um, same thing happened to Guy Williams, who was hired to be the lead in Lost in Space. He was the dad. He was the the rugged, you know, space hero type, you know, with the jaw. And he looked like a hero. He had played Zorro, and here he is. He, this is going to be my show. And then this uh, incredibly grating um, terrorist that stoves away, uh, that that's, is trying to destroy the spaceship. <laughs> He, put, he he sabotages the spaceship, and then he acts, and then it takes off with him on it. So he's accidentally, he's 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 like a, I think he's supposed. To, I don't think they ever said he was working for, but I think he was supposed to have been working for you know Russia or something. But they don't say it. Anyway, Doctor Smith was a bad guy, and then all of a sudden everyone loves Doctor Smith, and and, and and he gets all the screen time, and Guy Williams just uh, can make, can occasionally makes some appearances. Um, you know, the show would make a lot more sense if Will Robinson was hanging out with his father, and uh, as they had adventures. But instead, he's being babysat by this terrorist, this effeminate terrorist, and a robot. And you never hardly, the father's hardly ever there. But anyway, um, and Popeye too, uh, he, he, he came into Thimble Theater and, and that had been about the oil family, right? Castor oil and all. And then he pretty much takes over the whole strip. It has early Peanuts uh, reprints too. So it's really great. I was buying these real cheap and I was so excited. I had something, uh, I just felt like I had something historic. And look at that. You know, condition of these. Uh, it was so much fun to get something old. No, I mean, there was no eBay then. There was no way. It was just, and, and look, it's got little Abner in it. And, uh, but I've always loved, listen to that thunder. I've always loved the 50s and, and the time before. 60s. I, 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 I've always loved the time in the past, and uh, dang, just, Al Cap was so great. I mean, this morning on uh, 
Dr. Silverage's show, um, he was uh, they he and Shannon were talking about artists that they love, and and it's like there's so many great artists, and just seeing their art just gives you these great feelings, like hearing a great song come on the radio, you know, like uh, uh, hearing Little Darling come on, you know, the, the song is, and it's, it starts with, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You just hear it, it's like, wow. You just feel like you're in a bowling alley in the late 50s, and it's like uh, there's girls in poodle skirts, and it's just, but um, it's just like, Anyway, um, these things cheer you up. Now, let me tell you something about slabbing and C <laughs> C what is it? CGI, CGS. I don't even know what that shit's called. So I can't even believe I would send my comic book away for, I don't think it takes a year anymore, but it used to, for a while it was taking a year to get it back. And then it'll be encased in plastic so you can never look at it again. But you can look at the front cover and put it on your wall, and it will be, uh, um, and, and you, it's so exciting to see what, what rating will they give it. Will I get a 9.4? Will I get a 9.6? Or will I get the coveted 9.8? Um, but um, let me tell you, a nuclear war, that plastic's not going to save your comic books, man. And we're so close to a nuclear war now. It's just ridiculous, man. And now it came out the day before, it was yesterday, some guy leaked all these, some young 21-year-old guy, they've already arrested him, and they're going to, who knows what they're going to do to him. Because he released all these uh, documents saying that, because that, uh, the, the media has been trying to tell us how badly Russia's doing, and and, and that they're losing, and it's the, these inner documents uh, came out that said, no, that's not the case. And then uh, one of Obama's, I'm sorry, Biden, same thing. This uh, One of those head generals said, this is, these are documents that the public is not supposed to see. Well, and now they're finding out that we've got, we've got our, our people over there in the Ukraine. Um, the, the, and you just expect Russia to do nothing? Um, and now I hear, like, we're getting 500,000 rounds of ammunition uh, borrowed or, or given to us by South Korea because we've run out. Our military doesn't have any more because we sent it all to the Ukraine. Are, are, are we in out of our freaking minds? Here's, um, here's another copy of Tip Topper. Um, let's look at this one, shall we? I don't have any new comics to show you. I purchased nothing new, so therefore I'll show you things I bought in the 1970s, and that'll provide content. I hate that word content, but yeah, oh well. There was a great parody of this ad in in Harvey Kurtzman's EC Mad comic book, and I remember this guy was like really angry. I love parody. Anyway, this is the opposite of some of those shows where they just show you slabs. Very inspired by Meyer Greenblatt, who has been showing, he's been opening up comics and thumbing through them and showing them that's what you should do with comics. You need to read them. You don't need to just keep them in plastic because otherwise, damn, look at this artwork. This is such a great idea. This is how comic books started, actually, in the 1930s, reprinting the Sunday funnies. And it, th this artwork looks so great, shrunk into this size. And this character is uh, Curly K.O. Not a character I remember, but the artwork's great. And uh, it's by uh, the hell? Sam Le... Sam, is that Leaf or Leff? I think it's Sam Leff. I'll have to research Curly K.O., man. Wow, that's great stuff. And they have some Charlie Brown early uh, peanut strips. Yeah, these are, um, I wonder what these go for now. 
probably not much more than I paid for them in the 70s because it doesn't have Deadpool on the cover. Oh, well, I mean, spend your money how you want, um, I guess. Um... Here's uh, Tom Terrific. This was a Terry tune. Uh, it was a it was a made for television cartoon uh, done for CBS. It it um it appeared during the Captain Kangaroo show, and it was black and white. I mean, it was um, I I first saw it. I think when I was living in Germany in the early seventies. Anyway, it's amazing. It's a great comic. I use the word amazing too much. Um, and he had Mighty Manfred the Wonder Dog. I think it's healthy for comics to be handled, to be uh, paged through. I think uh, it's like I need to move my legs more so I, I'm not in agony every time I stand up and uh, I think comics need to be open and 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 reminded that they're valued and loved these are I wasn't the original owner of this someone owned it and loved it or it wouldn't exist now and somehow it's come down into my possession from the original owner. The original owner may have grown up and sold it, may have passed away, uh, may have been lost in a divorce, and then uh, some wife sold them all. There's no telling why it's in my hands now. But uh, it is. It is what it is, right? Um, let's look at this issue of Ha Ha. You know what's great is Alex Stein. Look up Alex Stein. He's got a show now that uh, Glenn Beck funds. It's out of Dallas called Primetime with 99. You got to watch this show. It's hilarious. It makes me laugh as much as the... Um, it, it, he makes me laugh as much as the original cast of Saturday Night Live did, man. He's he's great. And uh, I need to watch. I recorded it last night when it started. And then I'm glad I did because as soon as I uh, as soon as they finished airing it, they they took it down from YouTube. Either Tim Pool took it down or YouTube took it down. Probably Tim Pool took it down to avoid getting some like from YouTube. But anyway, it was it was live from Austin. Tim Pool was on the stage with some other people and Alex Jones was there and Alex Stein and they were all I think getting drunk, but I I was on the phone. I was recording it. I haven't yet watched it yet, but um that's um he's great. And I love Tucker Carlson. He really, I think, he's doing great things as far as waking up normal people. But there's something really weird about his laugh. You know, he, he's just, yeah, he's like, first of all, Tucker Carlson, he'll, he'll look at the person he's talking to like, like, uh, I don't know if I can recreate. He just looks at, at these people like uh, they're out of their minds, like, ah, uh, yeah. And then he'll laugh like, <laughs> he has this insane laugh, man. It's like, uh, I, I don't know. This is a, what they call a funny animal comic because there are animals in it and they do funny things like talk. Here are some elves. Um, damn. Look at how these panels are all wavy. These things were, you could get them really cheap at Duncanville Books. I mean, it's got like a chunk on, but um, February 1948. And um, 
Look at these insane looking people that are almost like Archie, but not quite. Ballpoint pens were a new invention at that time. Yeah. Well, it's like actually going through and touching historical documents. Like, uh, oh, if you ever order anything, I. Uh, I used to get these um, DVDs sent to me from Alex Jones. In every package you get, he gives you this. Uh, um, it's the Constitution printed in a little book. <laughs> um, the fireworks are in the document itself. Anyway, little. I've got several of these around. You just don't know where to, where do I put that? I can't really put it on a bookshelf. You know, you have this collector's instinct. I've got to file things away in their proper spots. And where am I going to put that? Ha ha comics. Here's another issue of ha ha. This is number sixty eight of ha ha. I think I was getting these for. Man, I can't remember if I was getting these for five dollars or two dollars. I think it could have been two dollars. Yes, I think actually, um, if you still, if you live in the Dallas Fort Worth area, you should be going there because, you know, Golden Age comics for $2 is almost unheard of. A new comic on the stands today probably costs six, seven. I don't know what a new comic costs, but something insane. This is, um, uh, it's hard to see, but that was once a red outfit on the rabbit there. It's, um, uh, um. He is a uh, rabbit Captain Marvel. Let's look at this book. It looks like it's got a tear on the front cover. And the reason these went so cheaply is because no one wanted them and that shopped at that store, for one thing. Also, they weren't in the best of condition. But, you know, 